Yes. She had already conceived Briasia Terrell. Briasia was two at the time that she met Henry Dinkins. And then by virtue of the relationship that the two of them engaged in, she um, became pregnant with Yale and conceived the child. Um, there was discussion about the nature of the relationship that existed as far as the family dynamics between Mr. Dinkins, um, Aisha Langford, um, and the children. Um, and I think what's very interesting to point out um, is conversations that occurred during the defendant's interview with Detective Obert um, that um, actually took on two different perspectives um, relative to the relationship that he shared with Aisha Langford during the initial stages of the interview and then the relationship that he shared with Aisha Langford um, toward the latter stages of the inter interview. But at any rate, here's what we know. Aisha Langford had indicated um, that when she began um, dating Mr. Dinkins, she was of the impression that Mr. Dinkins was much younger um, than um, he was. Um, he was an individual who had represented himself as being in his late 20s. Um, at some point in time, by virtue of the relationship that she shared with him, she discovered that he was a much older man. Um, she did indicate that he was very much involved in the children's lives during that initial stage um, of their um, relationship. But then time passed and that was not how you would characterize the dynamics that existed as far as Mr. Deacon's um, having contact with um, any of the three children on a regular basis or being a father who was actively involved in DL's life. Um, Aisha Langford, in helping us understand what that relationship was, very simply she indicated that he was an individual that when he got a new car or a new girlfriend he would show up to show off. That being said, let's go ahead and let's set the stage for what occurred during the summer of 2020. During the month of June, and at this point in time, Briasia is 10 years of age. Um, Aisha had talked about how there had been um, a cookout that had taken place down by the river, I believe. Um, she had attended the cookout with the children. Um, that was her first opportunity to meet Andrea Culberson, who was um, Mr. Dinkins' girlfriend. Um, that this was an event that Mr. Dinkins was present at, and I believe, but I would ask the courts to draw on its own recollection, um, I believe that he was the individual who was in charge of the cookout. Um, at any rate, um, you have what would be a scenario where there's more recent contact that had occurred, where Mr. Dinkins then is um, a father figure that DL, um, has had contact with, um, with in June, and then as of July 8th of 2020, as Ms. Langford indicated, when they were driving down the street with DL in the car, they happened to her observe Mr. Deacons pull into a quick shop. At that point in time, DL expressed an interest in being able to talk with his father and see his father, which prompted Ms. Langford to pull into the quick shop and have a conversation with Mr. Dinkins about how he needed to be more involved in his son's life and he needed to spend time with his son. As a result of that conversation, we know that the discussion opened up to Mr. Dinkins taking DL um, on July 9th so that he could spend some time with his son. Um, and then through um, out the course of July 9th through telephone records, the court was able to see that there was various contacts that had occurred. Um, but at any rate, we know that, on, I should say July 8th, let me correct that. On July 9th, that was the date that Mr. Dinkins um, picked DL up. Now, on July 9th, Aisha Langford was at work. She was working at Checkers there on East Locust Street. And so as a mother, her understanding of what was to transpire was very simply that Mr. Deacons was going to respond over to her mother's house, pick up DL, and take his son, his biological son, and spend time with him. When Mr. Deacons arrived there at the residence of Danita Gardner, who is the biological grandmother, the, um, the situation changed. 
Um, and as far as the events that developed there um, at the Gardner residence, Ms. Gardner described how she had been in a back room when Mr. Dinkins got there, um, when he came inside the residence and he was going to be gathering up his sons to leave. The conversation developed into Briasia um, being interested and wanting to come along. Aisha Langford had described that Briasia and DL were very, very close as hip, um, siblings, and quite honestly, they were attached at the hip, um, and it would not have been a surprise to her that DL would want his sister to go along with him. And so the um, conversation developed wherein Mr. Dinkins um, had um, consented to Briasia coming along, but, was, but what was very interesting about that conversation is this. C.S., the 13-year-old child and the teenager out of the group, wanted to be able to come along, and Mr. Dinkins would not allow him to accompany D.L. and his sister. Danita Gardner, during her testimony, spoke to that particular issue um, as she spoke to the fact that Aisha had no idea that Briasia actually ended up leaving her residence and accompanying Mr. Um, Dinkins, but at any rate that prompted a telephone call wherein Miss Gardner had advised her daughter that Briasia actually was going to go and spend time with Mr. Dinkins, her younger brother, and that once she got off work she would need to pack up clothing to take over to the apartment that Mr. Dinkins shared with Andrea Culberson there at Jersey Meadows apartment, which we now know as apartment number eight. Aisha Langford, she gets off work. She goes to her mother's residence, um, and I think um, one of the things um, that um, is important for purposes of discussion is this. We know that Aisha and her children were in a transition period. Um, they um, were in the process of having moved from a prior residence, um, and she had the children's items back um, boxed up. So when she went to her mother's residence, um, she um, got together clothing, for Briasia, she got together clothing for DL, and within that clothing, um, she packed pajamas for both of the children to wear. Um, additionally, there was footwear that um, would have gone over to the residence. And then once she um, had accomplished that task, she drove over to the Jersey Meadow apartment complex to drop the clothing off. Now, before we go further into a discussion about those particular details, I think it's important to stop and talk about Briasia as a child. One of the things that the state had talked with Aisha Langford about was whether or not Jersey Meadows apartment complex was a location that this child was familiar with, that either child was familiar with. Um, and she indicated that no, this was the first time um, that um, the children had ever been to this apartment complex. This was not an apartment complex that Briasia was familiar with. This was not an apartment complex that there were family members who lived at. Um, this was not an apartment complex that Briasia had friends that she um, knew. Um, and the reason that I bring that issue up is that I think it's very relevant to considering what happened in the middle of the night when Andrea Culberson woke up and found that Briasia was gone from the apartment. And I'll talk about that here in a moment. But I think that we've got to stop and we've got to consider these circumstances. Because in conjunction with that conversation, um, one of the conversations that occurred with Aisha Langford on the stand um, is um, a conversation about the per personality of Briasia. Was Briasia the type of child who was prone to waking up in the middle of the night and wandering off? Um, and um, Aisha um, described her children as being very sound sleepers. Um, and the grandmother even spoke to that particular issue. Um, and that once she went down, that child went down. But the other thing about Briasia, Briasia was a rule follower. She was not the type of child who would just get up and leave on her own. But even more importantly, Briasia was not the type of child who's going to get up in the middle of the night um, and leave an apartment in an apartment complex that she's not familiar with and just to wander off. Um, there was discussion during the course of the um, testimony, and I would ask the court to draw on its own recollection about this particular topic, but I believe both Aisha and Danita Gardner spoke to this, that Briasia was not a child who liked to go out in the dark. Now, Briasia was 10. Um, you consider a 10-year-old child in an environment that they are not familiar with. 
Um, and what's the likelihood that a child is going to get up in the middle of the night and just wander off? Beyond that, Briasia had some issues with her sight. Briasia had some issues with her hearing. But then even taking that a step further, the discussion that occurred was a description of her personality because the state thought that this was very important. What type of child is Briasia? And the one thing that Aisha talked about and even the grandmother had talked about is that Briasia was a truth teller. She was a child that would tell the truth no matter what. Um, and I think her grandmother's description was she described her as a tattletale. And so if her older brother or her younger brother were doing things that she didn't think was appropriate, Briasia was a child who was going to tell. And I think that that particular personal personality attribute um, is something that um, has significant bearing on the events that played out through the course of the night of July 10th um, and going to the early morning hours of July 10th of 2020. Taking that and setting that discussion aside, I want to jump over to the interview of Mr. Deacons. Um, uh, when Detective Obert met with him um, at the Davenport Police Department after Mr. Dinkins arrived there sometime around noon. Now, in that opening interview, the court um, had the opportunity to observe the conversation um, Mr. Dinkins engaged in with Detective Obert describing the family dynamic. Because at that point in time, essentially what we have according, well, um, in, in terms of the perspective of law enforcement, is we have a child who is missing. And so the focus of that investigation is to try and gather any information that they could about family relationships and this child and a timeline of events so that the information could be utilized um, to develop a plan to um, go out and search areas where Briasia might possibly be. During the context of that discussion, about the family dynamics, Henry Deakins portrayed himself um, as a father figure to Briasia, how he considered her to be his daughter. And when you hear those types of statements being made in the interview, it creates its own impression. It creates the impression that we have a man who is very much a part of this family's life. It creates an impression that we have a man who is probably exercising regular visitation, is probably a figure within this family's life, you know, on any day through any given week. And so when you create that impression, um, what it does is it lends itself to perception, all right? And here's what I mean by that. <clears throat> when you stop to think about the human experience um, and relationships that any of us have with individuals, um, depending upon um, the um, length of that relationship, depending upon the um, character of that relationship, the amount of contact that occurs in that relationship, that forms perceptions. So you may think that you know an individual, but if you have a lot of contact with that individual, um, that tends to create a sense of trust. You know, and we form perceptions about that, and that is the basis by which we determine whether or not we feel comfortable around this individual, whether or not we trust this individual, whether or not we trust this individual around our children and would feel comfortable with that individual spending time with our children. So Mr. Dinkins, when he's talking about, you know, how he perceives himself, himself as a father figure to Briasia, we're left with the impression that this is an individual who is very much involved in Briasia's life. And um, uh, that being said, this is an individual as a father figure who would never do anything to hurt that child. Um, Mr. Dickens talked about how close he was with Aisha and how they had a very good working relationship together as far as co-parenting. But then when you get to the latter stages of the interview, the complexion of those comments changes drastically. And he describes how they have a very contentious relationship, um, how um, they really don't speak 
um, at all. Um, and that's in stark contrast with what he would have led Detective Obert to believe during the initial stages. And that particular statement is in keeping with what Aisha Langford testified to about the family dynamic. And I think if we understand what the family dynamic is, it really speaks to comfort levels having an adult male who really isn't a father figure to Tubriasia getting up in the middle of the night and removing this child from the apartment without communicating with his girlfriend about their departure, not communicating with Aisha Langford about the departure, and not offering any um, explanation as to a legitimate reason for leaving the apartment complex. So that dynamic is very, very important. Now let's go back then and let's talk about how the events developed during the evening of July 9th. You know that once Aisha went back to her mother's, she packed up clothing for the children, um, and she went over to the apartment complex. Um, Briasia came down, was very happy. You know, the evening was going very well. Um, there was the puppy that had come with Aisha. Briasia was excited about that. Um, and then there was the handoff of the clothing with the mother, you know, letting her child know that she loves her. Mom leaves. And as Aisha is driving west on 53rd, we know that the weather is such that it begins to rain. <clears throat> and it's a significant rain. So much so that Ms. Lankford described how she had to pull over into a driveway over near um, North High because her windshield wipers couldn't keep up with the amount of rain that was coming down. The state brought that testimony out because it becomes very significant to later findings that were made when the Maroon Chevy Impala was lifted on that hoist so that the gas tank could be dropped to measure the amount of gasoline. That rain explains soil conditions that would have existed um, over in the area of Kunau Implement, where Briasia's remains were later recovered six months later. And it was because of that rain, and even discussions with other law enforcement officers um, who talked about the um, weather conditions throughout the night of July 10th. And when I talk about throughout the night, I'm talking about after the midnight hour, um, transitioning from July 9th into July 10th, and going to the um, morning hours of July 10th. So we've got that significant rainfall. We have a mother then who returns back to her own mother's apartment. Aisha described being very, very tired and that um, essentially what she did was she just lay down on the couch and she fell asleep and she was dead to the world because she was so exhausted. Danita Gardner was asked about that same circumstance and she also talked about how her daughter lay down on the couch and went to sleep. Now, as far as the um, plans for July 10th, Aisha was to work. Her um, typical scheduled shift, she would have gone in at 11, but because one of her co-workers hadn't come in to work, that prompted her manager to call her before the 8 o'clock hour and ask her to come in because he needed somebody there um, to um, cover um, for that co-worker who had called in. And so Aisha left her mother's residence, had gone into to work. As far as any contact that had occurred be between Aisha um, and her children, we know the last point of direct contact was when she dropped the clothing off to Aisha. And then through the phone records, we know that Bree had been utilizing Mr. Deacon's phone because neither child had cell phones um, that um, would have gone to that apartment. And there was the communications where there were um, a call or two, I don't remember right now, but the records will speak to that. Um, Aisha was asleep, she didn't answer that, but then there was the text message that um, came through about something like, good night mama, I love you, and then Aisha responding back um, later in the evening that um, as she loved um, uh, you know the two of the children um, and wishing them a good night. So the mother goes to sleep, everything seemed fine. There would be no reason for concern 
or worry. What happens then? Let's talk about the dynamics of what's occurring um, from the perspective of DL, Briasia, Mr. Deakins, and Andrea Culberson. So, when Mr. Deakins picked the children up, we know that he went over to the 700 block of Taylor Street. That's one of the things that the officers had talked about. Um, where he went to a relative's house, Vince Howard. Um, the children hung out there with a couple of little girls. There were the um, adult male figures that were there. The children were playing video games. Um, and then um, after that visit concluded, the three subjects, Mr. Deakins, Briasia, and DL, went over to Andrea Culberson's apartment. That's the apartment that Mr. Deakins shared with Andrea Culberson. Now, I want to talk about the visit to Taylor Street, and here's why. You know, when we stop and consider the testimony that came out through the course of this trial, as far as individuals who could provide statements about what happened during the middle of the night of July 10th at apartment number 8 there at the Jersey Meadow apartment complex, we have an 8-year-old child, and then we have Andrea Culberson, the adult. There's been a lot of discussion, you know, about a child who's eight years old and their ability to be able to recollect events, um, to be able to sequence those events, um, to be able to understand even what's going on. And during the course of interviews that you conduct of an eight-year-old, um, why is it that if you do um, an initial sit-down with a child, a child pro provides some details, but then when you extend that out, then the child um, is able to bring about more <coughs> details. The point that the state is going to make about DL is this. Everything that child described happening in his interviews formed the investigative construct for steps taken by officers of the Davenport Police Department in the investigation that they conducted. So, Mr. Dinkins, in his interview, after he picks up the children, describes having gone over to Vince Howard's house where the children played video games. That is absolutely consistent with what DL said. DL didn't know his father's friend's name, but he described going over to this house and spending time. Through the course of the um, investigation. One of the things that was talked about through the testimony, I believe, of Detective Obert, but I will ask the court to draw on its own recollection about this particular topic. That was an issue that was followed up by law enforcement. And Detective Obert did speak to this because Detective Obert and Detective Ann Siebert went over to Vince Howard's house on Taylor Street. Detective Siebert was that direct point of contact. Detective Obert was following some issues down, but they verified that yes, the children were there at the Howard residence, as Mr. Dinkins described, and as DL described. So then, when we go to the apartment complex, let's do the comparison between what Andrea Culberson describes happening and what DL describes what's happening. At no point in time, is there ever any type of divergence in what it is that both parties relate? Andrea, we know, works for AT&T. Um, Andrea works for home, at, from home, um, and Andrea still was working her shift and didn't get off until 7-something in the evening. Um, Andrea has her workstation set up in the bedroom. She described how Briasia was fascinated by the work that she was doing and wanted to learn. So the two spent some time, you know, bonding in that respect. And that was even something that Briasia was very excited to share with her mother. I bring that up because we're looking at issues of credibility throughout all of the testimony that was offered. And the one point that the state would definitely make is you see no discrepancies in testimony or statements provided by DL, or in testimony or statements 
um, offered by Andrea Culberson, um, and even like a small tangential issue like that relative to Aisha Langford and what she described happening. So, the children are there in the apartment. We know the apartment is very small. We know that it is an upper level apartment that has its own staircase dedicated to the apartment itself. So you come in that door, you go up the stairs, when you get to the top of the stairs, um, and as you get to the top of the stairs and you look over to your left, that's the main living area. We know it's just kind of an open area where we've got the living room, kitchen combination. And then we know if you were standing at the top of the staircase and you were looking at the wall ahead of you, um, basically if you go just a little bit further up toward the living room kitchen area, we've got that door that leads into the only bedroom that's there in that apartment. Um, and interestingly enough about that, you have to access that bedroom to go to the bathroom. And the other point of interest is this. The bedroom window itself actually faces out onto the parking lot. So the court um, had the ability to see the orientation of how you would access apartment number eight. Um, in order to get to apartment number eight, you had to go along the east side of the property, which essentially lies to the west of Costco. So it's back along that wooded line that separates the property of Costco to the back of Jersey Meadows. That window in the bedroom looks out onto the parking lot, and the court certainly understands the import of that. Um, throughout the night, Mr. Dinkins agrees with this, Andrea agrees with this, DL talks about this. DL's playing video games in the living room. Briasia is in the bedroom, and she's playing her own video game. DL, as an eight-year-old child, brings that issue up because he is there to spend time with his father. But he notes his father is spending time in the bedroom with Briasia as she's playing a video game. And Andrea Culberson gives us a little bit more perspective because she talks about how the three of them are sitting on the bed and they're playing some type of game where they're passing back and forth. But you have a father who's supposed to be spending time with his son and he makes the choice to spend time in the bedroom with this 10-year-old little girl. And what we saw during the interview of DL that bothered him and it made him mad because his father was supposed to be spending time with him, but his father was making the choice to spend time with his sister. At any rate, we know that at some point during the course of the evening, um, the children take the showers. Um, uh, there's complete agreement on that particular topic. We know that they have dinner. We know that rather than the children dressing in the pajamas that Aisha had brought over, Mr. Dinkins selected large white t-shirts for the two children to wear. Now why? Mr. Deacon's t-shirt is a 4XL. Why would you want to put a 4XL on a 10 year old child? It makes no sense. But when you think about that article of clothing, men's white t-shirts are very common articles of clothing. And knowing what occurred to Briasia, if Briasia were dressed in her own clothing, and we know that those clothes were later returned to Aisha, who went through those clothing, that, clothes, that, that bag of clothing, actually ended up being two bags of clothing, um, when they returned, she went through that clothing to try and identify what articles of clothing were missing, and there wasn't any missing. If Briasia had been dressed in her own little clothes, and Aisha did that inventory, she could say to law enforcement, these articles of clothing didn't come back. But Briasia is dressed in this white large t-shirt and her little black shorts and her little sports bra. So, Danielle, and Andrea Culberson, again, are absolutely consistent on what happened. Briasia goes to bed first. Andrea lays down on that air mattress in the living room where she and Mr. Dinkins were to sleep. She goes down sometime around 11 o'clock. She hears Mr. Dinkins say to DL, you've got till a little after 12 to finish playing that video game, and you're going down <coughs> to bed. 
DL indicates that his father is the third to go to sleep, and then he is the fourth individual to go to sleep. DL and Andrea both describe DL sleeping at the foot of the bed. And Briasia is up toward the top of the bed. Now, why do I even focus on that detail? Because, again, we're looking at an eight-year-old child who is providing information about activities. And everything that that child describes is in complete agreement with what is described by the adult in that apartment complex. All right, so then the question very simply is this. What happened after everyone went to sleep? We know definitively what happened in that apartment at 3 o'clock. We know that Andrea woke up to go to the bathroom. She noted Henry Dinkins wasn't there. She walks into the bedroom. She doesn't have her glasses on. But Aisha, I'm sorry, Briasia is not up there on the right side of the bed. DL is still down at the base of the bed asleep. Andrea goes to the bathroom, thinks, let me get my glasses on to make sure that I'm seeing what I'm seeing. She puts her glasses on, Briasia's not there. She checks throughout the apartment, Briasia's not there. Andrea Culberson <coughs> is very clear, at no point in time did Mr. Dinkins ever wake her up and indicate that he was going to be leaving that apartment with Briasia, that there was a potential medical emergency, that he had to take her to the hospital, um, that um, maybe the child was missing her mother and wanted to go home. There were no communications whatsoever. Andrea Culberson did not feel comfortable at all with her discovery. Now, Andrea Culberson testified she'd been involved in a relationship with Mr. Dinkins for six years. And she is not feeling comfortable at all. She feels so uncomfortable, she tells in her, or describes for the court in her testimony, that she didn't even want to think about the possibilities of why Mr. Dinkins was gone and why Briasia was gone. But she's so unsettled, rather than going to bed, she chooses to sit up in the living room in the dark to wait for Mr. Dinkins' return. She tried reaching out to contact him, but found that his cell phone was there in the apartment. Um, she talked about it charging, but then the question was also asked, is Mr. Dinkins the type of individual that goes around without his phone? And she said, no, he's not. Recognizing that the phone was plugged into a charger, this takes us to the photographs of the maroon Chevy Impala. And the court has had the opportunity to observe photographs that has that white aux cord um, and another cord that could be used for charging cell phones. But that phone is there in the apartment. And the state asserts that that is significant. Why? Because cell phones are devices that document the location of where that phone has traveled to. If an individual is abducting a child from an apartment complex, the last thing that you want is a, dig a digital device on your person to document locations that you are going. Because that provides leads to law enforcement. And those leads then can be utilized to determine <coughs> what had occurred. So the phone's there in the apartment. Aisha Langford gives us a very definitive time of 3.30, based on the clock on her desk. She said that she's sitting there in the dark. Mr. Deacons very quietly unlocks the door and very quietly comes up the stairs into the apartment in such a way so as not to awake anyone. Mr. Dinkins, of course, was not anticipating that Andrea Culberson would be up and would have discovered that both he and Briasia were gone from the apartment. 
Now, I'm going to step outside this conversation. I want to take us to the time frame of um, 8.55 in the morning of the Jersey Meadow apartment complex when Officer Burkle had responded to that location. In Mr. Dinkins' conversations with Officer Burkle, he created the impression that he wasn't familiar with this apartment complex and didn't even live there. And if the court will go back and reflect to the video footage that was collected from Officer Burkle's body-worn camera, Officer Burkle had said, you know, I know this sounds strange, um, but oftentimes um, when children come up missing, if law enforcement goes in and we do a search, we end up finding the children in closets or under the beds. Would you mind if I went into the apartment and conducted a search? What was Mr. Dinkins' response? We've already searched the, er <clears throat> the area. Officer Burkle persists. So Henry Dinkins then goes over to apartment 8, and rather than walking into that apartment, where he clearly lives, as described by Andrea Culberson, and he even has a closet that contains only his clothing, he knocks there at the door, as if he would simply be a guest, and he would have to wait for the tenant of that apartment to come down and answer the door. Miss Culberson comes down the stairs. Officer Brokel's right there at that front door. He has the conversation with Mr. Ms. Culberson about being able to go in and search and explained, you know, he had lost his own children like a child the week before. Um, she's very hesitant. She looks out the door. Mr. Dinkins isn't right there by Officer Burkle. He's several feet down the sidewalk near the corner of the building. Ms. Culberson looks out and says, is it okay with him? As if she's got to get permission. And Officer Burkle says yes, and then she says, well, the apartment's a mess. The court had an opportunity to see the apartment. Quite honestly, it wasn't a mess. And then Officer Burkle goes up. Briege is not there, but Henry Dinkins leaves the apartment complex, and nobody can find him. All right? So let's go back into the equation of the discussion that we had. Andrea makes it known to Mr. Dinkins that she is awake and she knows he's gone and she knows Briege is gone. Mr. Dinkins is not responding in any way to give information to her about what is going on. He goes into the bedroom to his closet and he digs in the closet. The court's been able to see the relationship of the bed to the closet on what would be the right side of that bed. Andrea Culberson describes going to the window, looking out onto the parking lot, and there the maroon Chevy Impala is parked. Briasia is standing right next to the passenger side of that vehicle. There's no dis um, question in her mind that it's Briasia. She talked about how she has very distinctive hair, um, but also she talked about how the child had been dressed in this white big t-shirt of Mr. Dinkins. Briasia is there. She can't see what Mr. Dinkins is getting out of his closet, but he puts it away in his clothing in such a way that she doesn't know what he's gotten out of the closet. Now, to take the court's attention back to testimony that she had offered here in court, and also testimony that DL had offered here in court, they both talked about how he had been wearing a black shirt. I throw that out because that is consistent with what Jared Brink had testified to when he had the contact with that black male subject over there on Highway 61 and then when he drove him over to the area of 270th Avenue. I also bring that up for this reason. Um, there was much ado being made about the fact that Mr. Dinkins was wearing um, that um, white t-shirt a man's undershirt that had no sleeves on it when we see him going into the quick shop and leaving. But then Mr. Brink is describing the black male subject having on some type of black shirt. 
the state went to photographs taken of articles removed from that vehicle, what do we see? We see an article of black clothing that had been taken out of the front passenger compartment. We also see a box of clothing in the rear portion of that trunk. To be able to pull an article of clothing out, put it on, take it off, is something that's very easy to do. But I bring that up because I think it's very important to mention before the state forgets that. So then, when Mr. Dinkins goes down that staircase, Andrea Culberson looks out, the Impala's gone, Mr. Dinkins gone, and Briasia is gone. She was asked specifically when she looked out and saw Briasia there, did you see any activity in the parking lot? None. Any individuals around? None. Those questions were asked because the assertion being from defense is that if Andrea did not see Mr. Dinkins get into that Impala, if Andrea did not see Briasia get into that Impala, then there's no evidence to show that Briasia was with Henry Dinkins, and the state absolutely disagrees with that. That sequence of events and the observations of Andrea Culberson absolutely answers that question. Mr. Dinkins left Jersey Meadow apartment complex with Briasia in the car, and we know that Briasia is still alive at 3.30. But what has happened before 3.30? and before Andrea's discovery that Briasia is missing. D.L. gives us a perspective. He talks about being asleep. He talks about how he's kicked very hard by his sister. There was a discussion about, is this simply a sibling who's rolling around, you know, and maybe they touched. No, this was different. This hurt. And then D.L., why he, while he didn't um, recollect that during his testimony, when he was interviewed on June 10th, described noticing his sister missing, hearing his father's voice, peeking out the bedroom, and seeing his father go down those stairs with Briasia and talking with her about cars. An interesting point that the child brings up when Aisha Lankford says, that Mr. Dinkins only comes around when he gets a new car or he gets a new girlfriend. So, what's happened between or before 3 a.m.? So between the time that everybody's gone down to bed with D.L. being the last individual in that house to fall asleep, what has happened between that time frame and 3 o'clock when Andrea makes the discovery. Now before I talk about this, I want, um, I, I've got um, a demonstrative exhibit that actually is a collection of still images that were a part of the exhibits the state has introduced. But Your Honor, just for purposes of perspective, let's go back down and let's just discuss the area of Schmidt Road and Credit Island if we can. We know that River Drive is um, our southernmost east-west street. And we know that the area that we're going to be talking about um, where Mr. Beacon's RV is parked and Credit Island, that's in an area of town that's more industrial in nature. Um, and so during this time of night, in the middle of the night, um, there's not a lot of activity there. Okay, so we know that Credit Island um, is on the south side of River Drive. We know that um, the um, southernmost point will be the Mississippi River um, that runs um, east and west along that area. We know that um, Schmidt Road, if you um, come out of Credit Island and you turn right or travel east, Schmidt Road essentially is about 400 meters. So the distance of um, one lap around the track. And, and I think that that was a very good way of describing it so that the court would understand the um, uh, um, uh, closeness of both entry points so that the, the court will understand it takes very little time to travel from Schmidt Road to enter onto Credit Island. Now, <clears throat> Schmidt Road we know is a north-south street. Um, at the southernmost point, this is where you turn onto River Drive. Um, it's not a very long street because then um, at its northern point, it turns onto Rockingham, 
which is our east-west street. And we know if we go further east, it turns into second. High V is our most western point on Rockingham that has video surveillance feed that gives us information about what happened after the trip to Clinton that morning. Then we know that Purina is a factory that is there at the corner of Rockingham and Schmidt Road. It lies on the eastern side of Rockingham and um, Schmidt. We know if you go from north to south on the east side, we've got Purina. We've got 743 Schmidt Road. That is that um, area where individuals can store their vehicles. We know that that's where Mr. Dinkins' RV was stored. And then we know then um, Jack's break in alignment um, is um, the um, southernmost building there. We've got video surveillance equipment on Jack's break in alignment. And this is a constant feed. So it never stops. We know at High V it's a constant feed. We know at Purina it's a constant feed. But then to the um, east of both 743 Schmidt and Jack's break in alignment, we have Devon Self Storage. We've got cameras affixed to this building, but they're only motion activated. All right. So those are our variables that we're working with. And then we know over here on River Drive, just to the west of Credit Island, if you come out of Credit Island and you look across the street, if you go down there and you ride your bike, you know, and you're familiar with the bike path down there, there's the bait shop. And then a couple of houses over is Sarah Lowe's residence. Her video um, surveillance equipment is affixed to the front of the house. And so then we know that in terms of the angle of that um, camera feed, it shows us that entry point onto Credit Island. So that sets our perspective there, and we understand the relationship of the cameras and activity and how that activity would have been picked up. All right, let's go to the state's first demonstrative exhibit. Now, as we read this, Your Honor, we're going to read from left to right. At 2.13 a.m., we see a vehicle, and it's a sedan, it's not a pickup, it's not a van, it's not an RV. We see a passenger vehicle traveling north on Schmidt Road. Let's stop and think about this. So what would be the most direct route of travel down to River Drive? If you leave that apartment complex, you travel down 53rd, heading west. You get on I-74, um, heading south. You exit on River Drive, heading west and that will take you out to the area of Schmidt Road and um, Credit Island. So, it makes sense that that vehicle is heading north because it's turned from River Drive heading north. That is at 2.13 a.m. I would ask the court to pay attention to the shape of what we see, the outline or the contours of this particular vehicle. Because when you stop and consider those contours and the shape, and you look at what we've seen about that vehicle, when we've seen it during the daylight hours, and how it seems like it just kind of slopes down a little bit toward the front, and maybe there's a bit of an elevation toward the rear, this is exactly consistent with that. So that vehicle is heading north at 2.13 a.m. Now, at Devon Self Storage, we see Mr. Deacon's RV right here. And we see a vehicle departing the lot at 229. So, between 213 and 229, we're talking about a time frame of 16 minutes, roughly. Okay? Then, we go down and we see that vehicle south on Schmidt Road and look at the shape of the vehicle. It is similar. That's at 2.30. Then the vehicle turns around at 2.31 going back north. So something is happening that makes that vehicle turn around within a time frame of a minute. So at 2.31 it's going back north on Schmidt Road then we have the camera at Devon Self Storage 
motion activated, and we can see the vehicle now leaving the area of Mr. Dinkins' motorhome at 249. This particular video feed, um, when the court had the ability to observe it up on the screen, we got a better perspective of what type of vehicle was leaving that lot, and it was consistent with a passenger vehicle. So 249, it's leaving, then we've got it south on Schmidt Road at 250. So between 231 and 249, we're talking about 18 minutes. 18 minutes back in that area plus an additional 16 minutes. So what's that giving us? That's giving us 34 minutes. What is going on in this RV over the course of 34 minutes? The court knows that this particular RV is not equipped for anybody to live there. There was no food in the refrigerator. There is um, no way to hook that RV up to water or anything at all. Um, there certainly were personal items that were being stored, stored there. There's a bed there that has bedding on it. Um, there's clothing and shoes and things like that. And this is a location that is um, attributable to be Mr. Dinkins RV. But then when it leaves south on Schmidt Road, it goes on to Credit Island, entering Credit Island at 251 and then leaving Credit Island at 2.53. All right. That was a topic of discussion that came up with Detective Obert. Um, and what was going on in this area of town. And I would ask the court to draw on its own recollection about how they were focusing on any type of cell activity um, to determine wh whether or not there was activity in that area with other individuals. And there was. So, there's two photographs that I want to point out to the court. The top photograph is the perspective of the camera angle when law enforcement got in with a search warrant where we can see that bed and then right there on a wooden box we have a cleaning product, and as um, the court can see, that cleaning product has bleach within it. This trial has spoken very extensively about the import of bleach. Bleach destroys DNA. The state finds it very significant that you've got a cleaning product right there by that bed. And the state finds it very significant that relative to all of the articles of evidence that were sent to the um, FBI laboratory in Quantico, or even the DCI laboratory, no DNA on anything. <coughs> it was actually clean. Um, isn't that what we would expect to find if an individual has the knowledge base to recognize the import of bleach and its ability to kill DNA? And we have that there, but we also have that as a product that Mr. Jenkins has purchased um, a little after 7 a.m. in Clinton. The state also points out this um, machete that was above the um, um, microwave. If the court looks very closely at those photographs, one of the things that the child talked about is how his father had wiped that machete down with a rag. The court can see the fibers within this machete. Um, we had our analyst come in from Quantico who testified to that, and she did indicate, Linda Otterstadter I believe it was, she did indicate that there were fibers within that. It didn't match um, a um, white and pink and I think purple striped um, cloth that was in the console, the Impala, and it didn't wa match that um, white um, uh, washcloth that went back with the children's clothing. But through the testimony, we know that there was a white washcloth at Andrea's that had been used to clean off Reisha's feet because they'd gotten muddy, all right? And so it didn't match. But the point being, the child had described it being wiped down, and he talked about there being bleach. Now, moving beyond that, so. This is all the activity that's happened even before Mr. Deacon returns to apartment 8. This evidence here speaks to what Mr. Deacon's intent was. For him to take that 10-year-old child from this apartment in the middle of the night and take her over to this area uptown to an RV speaks to his intent. 
And the state asserts, when you consider these circumstances and you consider the purchase of bleach and the use of bleach, this child was sexually assaulted in this area. But then it became very clear to Mr. Dinkins that there was going to be no way for him to control this child. And so therefore, it forced him to take further action, which was the murdering of Briasia Troyell. And so his returning to the apartment complex at 3.30, the um, item that um, he got, the state of service, is a gun. Now, let's go ahead and let's talk about the sequence of events from 3 a.m. to 3.45 a.m., which really speak to the issue of his intent, his premeditation, um, and the fact that he was going to um, uh, deliberately and willfully murder this child. After 3.30 a.m., and 3.30 a.m. is measured by the clock in Andrea's um, apartment. We know that he went to the quick shop um, on 53rd Street. Um, the counters are two minutes off. So we see, based on its date of 7-10-2020, that Impal is entering at 3.30. It's actually 3.32 a.m. in the morning. We see Mr. Dinkins pull up to the gas pump. Um, as the court can see, the dark tint on those windows precludes anyone from being able to look into the vehicle to see what was going on. But when he gets out of the car and he walks into the store, he's got that lanyard with his keys on him. He goes into the store, he makes the purchases. One of the things that is noted through testimony is the number of times that he kept looking out to that car. Now, if you pull up to a gas pump in the middle of the night, you know, and you have concerns about someone, you know, potentially getting in your car and stealing it and leaving it, well, there's two ways to deal with that. You lock it, um, and in this particular case, we know that Mr. Dinkins didn't leave his keys in the car because we've got that lanyard with him and those keys. He's gone in, he looks out the car, it's very clear that he's very interested in that vehicle, and then when he goes to the pump, he gets in the car after um, he starts pumping gas and he gets out after it's concluded. Why did Mr. Dinkins need to fill up with a full tank of gas? Um, the receipt was introduced. He purchased $34 worth of gas. What's a very important point to discuss here at this juncture is the fact that he presented a $100 bill. And then he got um, um, a 40 some dollars back. I'm not quite sure what that figure is. I bring that up because then <coughs> we need to go full circle back to um, his interview with Detective Obert. When he was asked by Detective Obert what his activities consisted during the middle of the night of July 10th, he acknowledged that he left the apartment three times. So would have left and came back. He said that he went over to Vince Howard's house, knocked on the door, nobody was there, he came back. Um, then he indicated that um, he wasn't sure, wouldn't give us a time frame, but he was out of money, uh, he only had a couple of dollars, and he may have gone over to his RV to get some money. Clearly, he didn't need money because he was able to present a $100 bill there at the quick shop, and he still had 40 some dollars after he made the purchases in addition to the gas, and then he was able to make the purchase there at the Walmart in Clinton um, after 7 a.m. of over $8.00. But then I would also note that even when um, Jared Brink pulled him out, he was offering him $100. So that's very relevant because it goes to the issue of credibility. The other um, issue I think that um, really falls um, within the context of this discussion is the fact that Mr. Dinkins will never ever provide a timeline for anything that he did. He's given Google Maps to draw locations where he said that he has gone. Bearing in mind, his first telephone call to Aisha Langford was this. I just woke up and Briasia's gone. We know that the text came in at 8.08 .08 a.m. Aisha was at work. She just checked in. She returns the call, and then we've got a series of calls after that where his first representation is, I just woke up and Briasia's gone. That certainly is not in accord with what all of the other witnesses have testified to. At any rate, we know he leaves at 3.38 a.m., and then a particular import is mile marker 124 at 3.44 and again at 3.45 when Detective Obert looked at the um, 
video surveillance feed from the um, DOT, it showed a sedan passing. Now we can't see what it is, but those variables are very important, particularly when we go to what happened with Jared Brink. And then we throw those time variables into the time variable of what was determined up in the area of Kunal implements. So, what definitively ties Mr. Jenkins to the area of Kunal implement during the early morning hours of July 10th, where Briasia Reagia's remains were located. The court has heard deposition testimony and then the court had the opportunity to watch the video um, uh, surveillance, or not the video surveillance, the interview of Jared Brink. Jared Brink, we know, lives somewhere further um, north and to the east of Kunal Implement. We know that Jared Brinks works at Linwood Mining here in Scott County, so essentially what he's got to do is he's got to travel from Clinton County. Um, the most direct route would quite honestly be I-80 down um, along um, the 280 to get off in the area of River Drive so that she could go to Buffalo where Linwood Mining is at. Um, he describes his morning routine, he gets up, he gets dressed, he gets his cup of coffee, he gets on the road and he heads out. Uh, Mr. Brink had indicated that when he was on Highway 61, and this is where we have a plot pointed, um, he was traveling south and a black male waved him down who was standing along the side of the road. This black male subject he described as wearing a dark shirt. Interestingly enough, he describes the black male as being more muscular, but when he saw the back um, image of Mr. Dinkins leaving the quick shop, he only had on that t-shirt that completely exposed his arms and showed a form-fitting t-shirt on his body. He indicated that this individual was more muscular in terms of what he could see. He described him wearing a black hat, which is exactly what DL described in, in his interview about how his mom had a do-rag on and how he had a cap on. He described this individual as having jewelry on. That's exactly what DL described his father wearing when we got to see his interviews yesterday. But even more importantly, he described the subject wearing a white denim type of short that had some type of screen imprint on it um, and he remembers there being blue and when he was shown the rear image of Mr. Dinkins leaving um, the quick shop he said those are the shorts. Jared Brink also described this black male subject as having a mole on the right side of his nose and the court had the opportunity to see the uh, press release the Davenport Police Department had prepared and had put out and sure enough what do we have? we have Mr. Dinkins with that mole, mole right beside his nose. At any rate, he stopped there. They go over to the area of 270th Avenue, and the vehicle is perpendicular across 270th Avenue, as if it tried doing a three-point turn, but the rear wheels went off the shoulder, which the court knows is a steep incline, to the west, and it got stuck and so he had to pull the vehicle out. The vehicle that he describes is a maroon Chevy Impala. He describes the interior as being tan, he thought it was leather, but at any rate, he also described it being clean and there being that white ox cord. That's an exact match to what we have in this particular case, Your Honor. Everything that he described matched Henry Dinkins to a T. And then we know based on his cell phone pinging, and then I'm going to have to have the court look up there because I can't tell. Maybe you can see it on the screen. But I think his phone, Mr. Brink's cell phone, is hitting off that cell phone tower in the area of Kunal Implement directionally toward the area of Kunal Implement at 4.27 a.m. in the morning. So, we've got the cell phone hitting there. We've got the area that is shown, number one, up here where that contact occurred on Highway 61. When we go to the map of 270th Avenue, where the vehicle was perpendicular across the road, that's the location that Mr. Brink had noted when he was shown those maps by um, Detective Sean Johnson. 
and then you take that and you overlay it with the locations that Special Agent McMillan had collected soil samples from after Briasia's body was recovered and the GPS coordinates. We know of the 10 soil samples, three of those were inclusive of soil samples on Mr. Dinkins' vehicle. There were a total of four soil samples taken from an, the undercarriage. Three toward the rear, those were matches. One toward the driver's side, toward the front of the vehicle, which was not a match. That is conclusive. Then we go back to the Impala. And let's talk about the Impala. When Mr. Dinkins presented himself um, to the Davenport Police Department, there's any number of areas that you could park right there in front of the department and walk in. When he was being interviewed by Detective Obert, he initially presents himself as having been dropped off and that his vehicle was mobile and that a friend had it, but didn't want to give any information about who that friend was. Then Detective Obert discerned that maybe he might have some issues with his li license and that might be why he's reluctant. He says, I'm not concerned about that at all. You know, the whole thing is about finding Briasia. And Mr. Dinkins still is not willing to give information about where that vehicle is at. By virtue of the bolo that went out, patrol officers received that information over their MDTs. Officer Pojar read that um, bolo and happened to observe the Maroon Chevy Impala parked a block down and to um, the north there on Main. And then the vehicle was seized and brought to the Davenport Police Department. Jill Foster took photographs of that vehicle and this was um, a topic of conversation um, that Miss um, Foster had talked about when we went around the vehicle. There were areas on the vehicle to show that there was the spray of <coughs> muddy dirt on the vehicle and you see it along the passenger side here in those areas. The other thing that's interesting about this, and the state's going to bring this back full circle, not only do we have soil around that vehicle that's consistent with it being up in this area, but then the other thing is the child had described how there had been a machete in the trunk of the vehicle, and one of the things that um, Sergeant Pfeiffer had talked about when they started to remove the remains from Briasia's skeletal, or remove the branches from Briasia's skeletal remains, he noted that it looked like a knife had been used to cut branches to lay over the top of her body. And so the state throws that in there because that get is another connection to this area up here in the area of Kunal Implement. As for additional identifiers, Mr. Brink picked out a white ox cord. That's exactly what was inside that vehicle when it was seized. Mr. Brief, when shown these photographs, or this photograph of Mr. Dinkins leaving the quick shop, it's an exact match. And of course, we've got the Maroon Chevy Impala that he described being shown by Joseph Adams after his wife had sent him the image. He picked out the Maroon Chevy Impala, and then we see the photograph of Mr. Dinkins there with the mole on the right side of his face. This takes us to the last portion of the story. And the conduct of Mr. Stinkins speaks about volumes, uh, volumes about his involvement um, in the murder of Briasia. We know sometime after sunrise, um, according to Detective Hamas's testimony when she was doing the interview, she'd asked, um, you know, <coughs> sell your device. Um, what time the sun rose, and I think it was like maybe at about 5.38 on um, June 10th, or July 10th. Um, we know that Mr. Dinkins returned to the apartment sometime during the early morning hours. Um, sometime after sunrise, Andrea Culberson wasn't able to give us that time. But then we know that when he came up, he got 
DL. He left. He gathered up the children's clothing, which is very interesting. Um, and then he goes to leave without his phone. Andrea Culberson insists that he takes his phone. So he takes it, leaves with the child. She discovers that there's another bag with the children's clothing. She calls him. He comes back. We see his movement through the video surveillance on the feeds. We see that vehicle going past the Quick Star on 53rd. And this is before the 6 o'clock hour. We see it going east on Eastern by virtue of the camera at Judson Court that faces out onto Eastern. Through the cellular data um, that was provided to us through Special Agent Federer, we know that he traveled east on Eastern, back, or north on Eastern, I'm sorry, Your Honor, back east on Veterans Memorial, back south on Jersey Ridge, back to the apartment complex, which is consistent with him picking up the clothes, and then leaving. Then he goes back north on Jersey, and then we've got him at mile marker 124. I will ask the court to rely on its own recollection, but I think that that was about 6.11 a.m. We know then that he went to the Walmart in Clinton where he purchased the Clorox because DL tells us that his father had his cell phone um, in the cup holder and the battery had been removed. And when his father went into the store, and we know he entered at 7.04 a.m., that he took the battery, put it in to play a video game. When he saw his father coming out, he removed it so he wouldn't get, us, get in trouble. It was that event that allowed us to develop what happened out in Clinton. We know then, by virtue of the canvassing and looking for video feed, we saw him coming past Posh Farms, past First State Central Bank, going into Walmart. We saw the video feed at Walmart. We see him going back past First Central State Bank, Posh Farms, and then back along mile marker 124. We know he purchased Clorox. DL described how his father went to two wooded areas. Um, and the one wooded area that he described, um, he described as there being woods, and then there was a road down and you could see a pond. That's Kunal implement. He described his father getting out of the car, and he described his father um, uh, um, having a knife and having wiped it off, and he knew it was Clorox because he could smell the odor of Clorox. Um, when we look at the travel times, if you drove past mile marker 124 and went the speed limit, it would only take you 22 minutes to get on Highway 30 and go past posh, posh Farms. On the trip out, it was 32 minutes. On the trip back, it was 37 minutes. 15 more minutes on the trip back. And what do we have? When Briage's remains are recovered, we've got those clothing articles that are recovered, the shorts, the t-shirt, and the little bra. The court had the ability to see those articles of clothing as they were pulled out by Sergeant Pfeiffer then the court had the ability to be able to see photographs, but most importantly, the photograph that came from the state medical examiner's office. When you look at those black shorts, and this is what Sergeant Pfeiffer had talked about, there was discoloration in the fabric, and we could very clearly see it based on what the lighting conditions um, were when that photograph was ta taken at the state medical examiner's office, and you can see that discoloration. <coughs> very significant. If you have a child, who has been sexually assaulted, you have the perpetrator's DNA that's present on that child's body. Bleach will kill that DNA. Kremlis Stepanski had testified that they had made a judgment call about how they were going to proceed as it relates to the articles of clothing to see if there was bleach. So they noted discoloration on that white t-shirt. They took cuttings. And recognizing that we've got variables that are working against us. Creation has been out in the elements for a significant period of time. Her body has decomposed. The clothing has been out there in the sun, the wind, the rain, the snow. All of that compromises DNA. But when 
He went through the series of tests for those cuttings. He noted that Clorox has four specific elements. Those four elements were noted when the analysis was made of those cuttings. Then he described how he used water to try and pull things out of that fabric to do a pH test with Clorox being basic at 10. This came in at a 7. But he said, bear in mind, water will dilute the pH. And then Clorox in a color test will test a dark blue. This came back as a light blue. But bearing in mind, liquid will dilute the color. He couldn't make a conclusive determination, but the findings are very significant when you combine it with everything else that had happened and the defendant's activities in purchasing bleach. And that tells us everything about what was occurring. occurring. Mr. Dinkins is very savvy. He knew exactly what it is that he needed to do to destroy the evidence and steps were taken to do that. And that is conclusively shown by lab report after lab report after lab report that ended up with negative findings. The only thing he couldn't control was the issue of the soil samples underneath his vehicle that ties his vehicle to that area. I think as far as the last points that I would make, and I'm just thinking about different testimony that was offered. I think at this juncture, really what it comes down to is this. What caused Briasia's death? We heard testimony that she was shot through her left mandible. It traveled through her C3 and C4, out the back of her neck, and got caught in her little hair. She was shot twice, from front, on the right side of her body, to the left, <coughs> and that's where we see the damage from the bullets in the scapula. And Dr. Cruz, when asked to opine as to the cause of death and manner of death, indicated that she died of gunshot wounds and the manner of death was homicide. And then the final piece of the puzzle comes um, into play relative to those casings, I shouldn't say casings, those bullets that were found with Briasia's body. Um, there were three. There was damage to some. However, when Mike Tate, I believe, talked about this, I get Mike Tate and Mike Schmidt mis mixed up, he talked about how he goes through the process of weighing that ammunition to get a sense of the caliber, and it was 38 caliber ammunition. That gun that was recovered from the pond, there were empty casings within that revolver. It was 38 caliber ammunition. While there was damage to the bullets, there were markings on those bullets that could be um, compared to the types of markings that would be generated from the Lassier Comanche. Um, and when you stop and consider the manufacturing process and the types of markings that it leaves, it was consistent with that. And when um, Mike Tate ran the types of guns that would, um, could be used to fire this type of ammunition, the Lassier Comanche was on that list. Your Honor, when you go through this entire sequence of events, um, while most of the evidence is circumstantial, and we do have some direct evidence, the evidence is, in this case is overwhelming. And the conclusions are clear. The child was taken from that apartment by a man who was not her father, she was taken so that the adult nor her brother would know. She was sexually assaulted, and then that child was murdered. And based on all of this, the state is asking you to find Mr. Dinkins guilty of murder in the first degree and kidnapping in the first degree. Thank you. We'll take our mid-morning break at this time. We'll reconvene in approximately 15 minutes.
is that to be very careful who you point the finger at. When you point the finger at someone, three more are always pointing right back at you. And nowhere in my career have I seen a case where the finger of accusation being pointed at a client has three more pointed back at the prosecution more strongly and more firmly than this one right here. I'm going to submit to you just very plainly that this case is being thrown in your lap because the prosecution doesn't trust you. They don't trust you to convict Mr. Dickens on this evidentiary record. They want you to decide this case on a motion. They want you to decide the case with cameras and media in the courtroom, all the officers sitting here. They want you to de uh, decide the case based upon that rather than this fairy tale that they, that they have spun. And this circumstantial, and I use that in quotes, <coughs> evidence case that they want you to believe. <coughs> Rhetorically, I want to look you in the eye. I want to ask you a couple of questions. Are you totally convinced that Henry Dinkins committed these crimes? Are you firmly and fully satisfied that the evidence that's been presented before you is enough to say that Henry Dinkins committed these crimes. Those are really the burning questions for you because that's what reasonable doubt comes down to. You know, our Supreme Court uh, has approved the jury instruction that says, uh, based upon all the evidence, drawing all the inferences from the evidence, or in some cases, lack of evidence produced, would a reasonable person hesitate to act. And I would submit to you that if someone come up to you and said, did Henry Dickens commit murder in the first degree? Did Henry Dickens commit kidnapping in the first degree? Would you immediately say yes, or would you have to stop and think? There's no way in, on this evidentiary record that you would not have to stop and think. Because there simply is no evidence to support the state's theory that this man committed these crimes. You simply cannot say, based upon what has been presented here, that Henry Dinkins set apart, set out on a plan to sexually assault this 10-year-old girl and then decide to execute her. Because that's what it was. It was an execution. Any reasonable person would hesitate to act on this record person may have an opinion. I think the state has an opinion. I think the state feels they got it right. I think the state thinks that Henry Dinkins did this, but that's not the standard. The standard is, did the state prove it beyond a reasonable doubt? This is not a whodunit. This is not a whodunit. This is who proved it. I find it ironic that we're talking about Henry Dinkins committing sexual abuse upon Briasia Terrell but we're not here talking about him being charged with sexual abuse upon Briasia Terrell. I find that very ironic, and so should you. I find it ironic that there's not one piece of physical evidence that can say ever that Henry Dinkins touched this girl in any way, let alone even give her an untoward glance or make an off-color comment, or tell her she looks nice, even give her a compliment about her appearance. None of that. What we have is, and what this court is being asked to believe is, by fact that he wasn't paying attention to his biological son, therefore he must be some insidious intent toward a non-biological child with whom he had a relationship. And because he spent more time in the bedroom watching her play a video game and playing a video game with her and with Andrea Culberson, that got the wheels turning and that got the libido moving. And there's absolutely no evidence of that. Andrea Culberson didn't give you any indication that Henry Dinkins was acting untoward toward Briasia Terrell. In fact, 
the evidence you've heard is quite the contrary. The evidence you heard from DL, and we'll talk a lot about DL down the road, but from Andrea Culberson was that everyone was happy that night. It was a good night. You heard it from Aisha Langford as well, that when Briasia come down to get her clothes, she was happy. She was learning how to be an AT&T operator. It was a good night. Henry cooked dinner that evening for the kids. And he cooked dinner for Aisha as well, even though she's a stepchild. Aisha liked going over there because she liked the snacks. It was Henry, I'm sorry, Briasia, because he liked the snacks. Now is Henry Dinkins set about grooming this little girl with vanilla Oreos? I don't think so. Okay, that's a theory that the state may have. That speaks volumes as to what this case is. It's a case built upon conjecture. It's a, bait, a case built upon supposition. It's a case built upon uh, assumption. And it's a case built upon hypothesis. I think you heard Detective Obert say, it's the theory. That's in the record. It's the theory. We don't convict people on theories. We convict people on evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's just not here. The threshold question, of course, and the state admits this when they went into the a sexual assault uh, discussion right off the bat, is why. What motive did Henry Dinkins have to hurt this little girl? None. Absolutely none. In her 10 years of life, he had only been good to that girl. Was he there every day of her life? No. Was he there to provide and be the perfect father figure? No. Uh, but we're not judging him as a father. We're not judging him as a stepfather. But he was there enough for her to have a relationship with him. He was there enough for her to feel comfortable going there. And most importantly, he was there enough that Grandma, Danita Gardner, felt comfortable sending her along. I would submit that Danita Gardner would not have sent her child, her grandchild along if she felt any inkling that this child was in danger, that Henry Dinkins would somehow sexually harm that child. That's common sense in this case. And in fact, uh, you heard Henry's or testimony that Henry first said, no, I'm going to spend the weekend with D.L. And then D.L. kept saying, come on, uh, uh, Briasia, come on, Briasia. And finally, and you can see D.L. doing that. He's kind of a, a, a hyper rambunctious kid. Uh, Briasia relented and Grandma relented as well. But the plan, if there ever was one, was uh, at that point for uh, Briasia to come along. This man had not seen D.L. in over a month since the cookout, and so it was never discussed for Briasia to come over. So to think that he had some sort of preconceived notion that he and Briasia were going to engage in some sort of illicit activity just isn't there either. Uh, Aisha Langford was informed that Briasia was over there, and she was fine too. Both Danita Gardner and Aisha Langford testified that relationships between Briasia and uh, Henry were good. And neither one had a problem with, with Briasia spending the night, even though it was the first night at this new location. So the, the crime just has to make sense. And the state knows this. The state knows this. I mean, they absolutely know this. So they try to spin this yarn that he's standing in a bedroom in this very small apartment and uh, D.L. says he peeks a couple times and sees Dad spending more time with Briasia. We're going to rely on that as a motive, a motive to commit a sex act that he sexually abused this child. I'd say not. And then there has to be some connection to that and why he would want her dead. And the state has tried to put together this elaborate time frame uh, with evidence that they say could be Henry Dinkins uh, to say that he actually sexually abused her. Now, 
Miss Cunningham called Henry very savvy. I disagree with that. I disagree with that wholly. I mean, look at this man right here. He is not a savvy individual in that regard. If you think about and compress this down to almost the most ridiculous time frame that we have, everybody in that apartment was, uh, as far as the children, and Miss Culberson at least, is asleep by midnight. Um, Mr. Dinkins was in the Davenport Police Department by noon the next day. That's a 12-hour window. 12-hour window for him to accomplish a lot of things um, that just doesn't make sense. Those 12 hours uh, include waking up Briasia, who's a tattletale, who joins him voluntarily, and evidently the theory is that some sedan they can't identify that car as Mr. Dinkins, first of all. It's just a sedan. Goes down to his RV, uh, and these people get out of the car down to the RV. They can't put him in the RV. This in the area of the RV. Uh, Henry rapes her. And then uh, evidently goes back again to probably cover up the crime comes back and we know he's at the home at 3.30 a.m. At 3.30 a.m. he's in the house um, and Briasia is seen by Miss Culberson outside the Impala. I think it bears noting that no one ever put Briasia inside that Impala. No one. Didn't even try. There wasn't even an effort to put her in that Impala. It was the assumption that she was in the Impala. At 3.30 then, they assume that these two take off. He drives her up to the area of Kunau Implement, 20, 30 minutes, uh, kills her. Somehow takes uh, the time to uh, shoot her three times, and we'll talk about the shooting, somewhat cover it up, and get back to uh, Jersey Meadows around 5.30ish and pick up his son. And he and his son go back to Clinton. It's 7 o'clock, they're at the Walmart in Clinton. They take their time coming back. If you believe uh, uh, DL's version of the events, he's covering it up with bleach out there, and they're back in town by 8 o'clock. And 8 o'clock to 12 o'clock, um, there's phone calls being made. He's supposedly moving about Clinton, but then this time also he's discarding clothes. He's sh showering and scrubbing himself up, uh, making sure all possible crime scenes are sprayed with bleach. Uh, and, and doing it 100% successfully. So not only has he got the mindset to be able to do all this, but he's doing it to an absolute T. There's absolutely nothing left behind. They want to talk a lot about bleach and how bleach destroys DNA, but they also have to get you to assume and understand that not only if, if their theory is right, that Mr. Dinkins not only did it, but he did it to the point that he destroyed any possibility of DNA at any crime location on any piece of evidence. Because what they forget to tell you, Your Honor, is that they brought in the FBI crime team, okay? They didn't bring in just local people with local resources. They brought in the FBI crime team and they spent hours, hours combing that RV, okay? And in that RV they took everything that they thought there would be DNA on. They took anything they thought there would be blood on. They took anything they thought there would be semen on. They vacuumed their little special vacuums they thought would get any trace evidence on. They took hair. For crying out loud, these people were dressed in uh, uh, 
Tyvek suits, uh, rubber, rubber boots, hats. That's how seriously they took preservation of evidence. And what do we know they found in the RV? Nothing. They were asked to test for blood and semen because from jump, this case was thought to be Henry Dinkins raped this little girl. And that was their theory and that's what they were going with. And the very first moment that man went to the police station, that was their theory. Can't convince me otherwise, Your Honor, because they were testing for blood and semen on July 14th. Why, why was they only testing for that? Why won't they want all DNA to see maybe who else had been in there? Blood and semen. Their, their choice at that point was to make a case against Henry Dinkins, not build a case based upon the evidence. You see, they had already concluded that Henry Dinkins had done this. And now we're going to build the evidence around that conclusion and pick only the evidence that surrounds that conclusion. But nothing in that RV. Now, had she been raped in that RV, they would have found something. I would submit that to you. A hair. Some sort of DNA. But they didn't test for DNA. And that's not his fault. It's their burden. It's their burden. And they had that evidence back within a month or so. And they had no blood. They had no semen. And they had no trace evidence. And they had a good year and a half to say, you know what, let's send that back to, to the FBI or ask the FBI to test it or send it on to the DCI. They can do DNA testing on any cuttings or swabs or fabric or whatever. But what was the answer we got when I asked that of Detective Pfeiffer? My supervisor said no. My supervisor said no. Not his fault. Their fault, their burden. They say they say they, she was assaulted in that RV. They need to prove she was assaulted in that RV. Not just say, well, there was cleaner bleach sitting there, so he must have cleaned it up. Okay, we now know we have a test for bleach. TCI, we heard Agent Stepanski. Okay, let's have Agent Stepanski test it for bleach. There's no elements breaking down anything in the RV. We have it in a controlled environment, for Christ's sake. Let's test that area for bleach. But then, if it hadn't come back with the uh, answer they wanted, they pivot off that and say, well, you know, there's bleach and laundry products, and we wouldn't have found it there anyway. But note, when they searched that vehicle on July 10, when they went into that vehicle, hours after this young girl had supposedly been sexually assaulted, hours after this man supposedly sprayed it all down with cleaner bleach and killed all the DNA and got rid of any evidence, no odor of bleach was detected. And when, you, when you're going to kill DNA, Your Honor, I would submit that when you're going to kill DNA, you don't give it just a couple squirts. You make sure it's dead. You make sure it's gone. And in that enclosed environment, that small enclosed environment, you're going to smell bleach. But then they introduce these, these albatross pieces of evidence meant to scare you, meant to, to uh, prejudice you, like the, the machete, which has nothing to do with anything in this case. There's no evidence that machete was used in any crime. There was no sharp force trauma to Brasia Terrell and Dr. Graham. Dr. Cruz both said that there could have been maybe should have been, if that large knife was used to harm Brigitte Terrell. And look at that evidence. Look at it closely. That, that machete is brand new. Not a nick on the blade. The hone, the edge of that blade is just like you bought it at the store. There's not so much as, as anything that would say uh, that was used uh, to, to cut a bush. It is brand new. But we have white fibers on there, and we tested it against some other fibers. They didn't match, but you know, we'll forget about that. And, oh, we have a baseball bat. 
I'm going to ask you rhetorically again, what does a baseball bat have to do with anything? It's in the evidence, and we found it in the trunk, and baseball bats can be scary in crime cases, but there's no evidence to support what the baseball bat has to do with anything. Well, it's a prejudicial piece of evidence and makes Harry, Henry look scary. And then the hatchet. Well, the hatchet, you look at that as well, brand new. Brand new. Never been used. Never been used. Has nothing to do with anything in this case. <coughs> you, uh... Think back to the testimony of, of Danita Gardner. She was asked by the state about how Henry was with the children, um, and how he disciplined, and if, if he ever disciplined uh, Briasia. <coughs> the answer was no. In fact, his discipline with DL was, was uh, not very often. Uh, but when he did, he made him run. He wasn't the guy that got physical with the children. Um, at the cookout, he brought stuff for the children, brought them candy, things like that. He was an affectionate guy. No markers that he was trying to groom Briasia for anything. Uh, they want you to believe that he was, he was that night in the bedroom playing video games and this idea popped in his head, well, I'm going to molest this girl who, I've, who I think of as my daughter. And now the state wants you to say, well, because he didn't do one, two, three, four, five, rationally, during a time where I would submit to you things were irrational, your child is missing, your, your, your uh, son's mother's other child is missing, you may not think exactly the way that you would think in rational circumstances. So they're going to put judgment on that. They're going to put judgment on that. They're going to judge him as a stepfather and say, well, that makes him a killer. That makes him a sexual abuser. Bottom line is, the state developed their theory way too early in this case. And that theory was, Henry Dinkins killed this girl. Henry Dinkins molested this girl, so now let's go find the evidence to find it. And the problem is, they couldn't find it. They had all the evidence to possibly put her in that Impala, but they didn't test for the DNA to put her in the Impala because the FBI was told she was in the Impala. And when it came back that we didn't test her DNA in the Impala, then the brass at the Davenport PD said, don't test for it. Why on earth was that not done? I'm gonna have Mr. Waters also show a couple of photos right here, and I'll have them state for me which they are. Which one is this, Joel? Picture 12-17, this is a photo that come from the rear passenger side of the Impala. What I want the court to see there is you'll see one, two, three water bottles. You'll see a can of Pringles. You'll see a, a, a cup, a black cup there. What do people do with water bottles and cups and Pringles? They eat the Pringles, they drink the water bottles, they sip out of the cup. What do people do when they drink out of water bottles, drink out of cups, and eat Pringles? They leave, they leave uh, DNA behind. Those weren't seized or handled for DNA either, all of which could have put Briasia Terrell in that Impala. None of which would have proved she'd been sexually assaulted, but all could have put her in that Impala that night. But that was ignored. Again, shows the theory that they were looking through tunnel vision and had their decision made. He sexually assaulted her, and that's why she's dead. We just got to find her, and we'll build our case around that. I'll have Mr. Waters show the other one. <coughs> this is 12-24. Sorry? This is 12-24, and this is from the rear driver door. And what you see there again, another water bottle another uh, Diet Mountain Dew bottle. You even see what appears to be a kid's mask. Um, now, again, 
Those were drank by someone. A mask was worn by someone. Those are some things we can get DNA off of, Your Honor. Uh, none of those prove sexual assault. You aren't going to find any blood or semen on those. I know that. You know that. But again, those are items where we commonly find DNA. They weren't tested because their mind had been made up that she was in that car. He had raped her. And he'd find blood. But again, they had the opportunity, they had the evidence for a year, year and a half, and they just chose not to because the bosses said, don't worry about it. When you, when you think about, you, you can take those off. When you think about the uh, state's argument, um, they talked about how Henry portrayed himself as a father figure at the beginning of the interview. And uh, toward the end of the interview, uh, the issues between he and Aisha kind of came out that it was maybe a little antagonistic. Uh, I, I don't know how that can be considered proof that he killed or raped anybody. Um, any relationship between people, especially who aren't together anymore, is going to have that. You can be a father figure to someone and not get along with mom all the time. I mean, this court is very experienced in things like that. Um, but she said that Henry tried to show the outward uh, perception that uh, Miss Langford and Miss Gardner had a sense of trust about uh, about him and that he would never do anything to hurt the child. That's not a perception. That's a fact. Those kids wouldn't have been there had those, those two individuals thought that Henry would never do anything to hurt a child. But since the interview got tense later on, uh, something changed. Somehow those perceptions must have changed, and that's just not true. That's not just not true. The evening went well. Those, July 9th was a good time for all those people, and there was no need for anyone to concern or worry. And even Aisha said it, it went well, and she was there later that night. The, the death of, of Brigasia, we need to talk about, about that. Um, because it was, a, it was an execution. It was a terrible death. Okay? I don't think there's any doubt that she likely was shot right where she was found. Um, and think about the person that pulled the trigger. Uh, I would submit to you that the person that pulled that trigger was very close to that 10-year-old girl. And he pulled that trigger one, two, three times on a 10-year-old child. That takes a special kind of person to do that. That's not him. So fold that kind of person into the theory that the government wants you to understand that, OK, we're playing video games. It made DL mad, uh, at least to the point where he noticed it. He has this idea that now I'm going to uh, molest this girl. And I did it, according to the state. And then I take her back home, according to the state. She gets out of the car, and she's a tattletale and all. And she waits. She waits outside the car, if you believe the state, right? She waits for Henry to supposedly go, get, go in and get a gun, which we heard no evidence of anyone ever seeing him with a gun, ever seeing him with the ammunition, and I don't think the evidence came in that he was hiding something. Andrea Culberson said she just couldn't see him with anything. There's a difference. And then she waited for him to come back. Now, I think the government argued that he knew that she was going to tattletale on the fact that he had just molested her. So he went in and got this six-shooter that no one knew anything about, never seen before, with no additional ammunition anywhere. 
And I submit to you that's pretty telling because where you see a gun, you see ammunition. The likelihood of someone having a six shooter with no additional ammunition anywhere is zero. Where you have a gun, you have ammunition. You saw that in Andrea Culberson's gun. She had 50 rounds right with her gun. You don't just carry around a cylinder full of Winchester 38 plus P's. There would be 10, 12 bullets. Even if they were loose, there's always extra. So how did he know that Briasia was going to tell on him? You have to assume she said so. You would think she would be distraught. You think she would be upset. But instead, she stands outside the car, according to Andrea Culberson, and if you believe the state's theory, she waited. And then she got back in the car with Mr. Dinkins. And then he goes to Quick Shop, and he goes in and gives seven glances, seven glances out to his, to his car at 3.30 in the morning, and I'm not sure that's such a big deal. But if that's your evidence you can rely on to convict this man, that's a stretch, Your Honor. That's a big stretch. And he takes his keys with him at 3.30 in the morning, I would submit, he should. And he filled up his tank with gas. Well, he needed a full tank of gas to go to Clinton. People fill their tanks all the time when they need gas. The fact that he's filling it up to go to Clinton <coughs> is an, another speculation. That's not circumstantial evidence. That's speculation. The, the seven nods out to the, uh, the car, that's not circumstantial evidence. That's speculation. They're guessing on what he's doing. That's all they're, they want to call it circumstantial, but it's all theory, it's all guesswork, it's all speculation. And this tattletale, who you would assume has just been through a very traumatic, terrible experience, according to the state, stays in the car. Doesn't tattletale to anybody else. There's people in that parking lot, people going in and out of quick stop, shop. Um, she has a good mama, she has a good grandma. I'm sure she was told about stuff like this. If she's in that car, uh, no evidence she was bound, no evidence she was restrained. Uh, look at the video of the car, the car just sits dead still right there. Um, nothing going on. So evidently she rides along, they go up to Kunau Implement, and then he takes her down in the woods, this girl he's fond of at least, and he walks her into the woods, and then essentially that from a very close range, this man has it in him to stick three thirty-eight slugs in her head and chest and leave her there and then have the time or whatever to try to cover it up. This is all this is all thought about by him. So he's already covered up the sexual assault. So now he's now he's killed her, he's executed her. And now he's got to cover that up. I mean this man is the best cover-up artist should be on TV. But now he's done that. Now he's done that. If you follow the state's theory. And then he decides to walk over and dump the gun in the, in the water. Get rid of the gun. Now, they talk about time frames. You know, time frames, they, they can be fickle. You know, people drive different speeds, people stop along the way, whatever. The time frames prove very little without something to put, to, to put with it. So they, used, they try to use Jared Brink, okay? And don't get tripped up by Jared Brink. Do not get tripped up by Jared Brink. I'll have Mr. Waters use the pointer and point to the first uh, picture up, up in the upper right. This is the, the information of Jared Brink. In the first picture way up right, that was the pictures of the uh, vehicles and the photos of Mr. Dinkins that were shown to Jared Brink. Now, I will direct you to his deposition testimony and his interview, Your Honor. 
Mr. Brink told officers that he could not pick Mr. Dinkins out of a six-person lineup. He did say that one of those on the top, I believe it was the upper right-hand corner, or maybe the one in the middle, could have been the driver of the car if he gained 50 more pounds. Okay. He also, in his deposition testimony, under oath, under oath, used the term Malibu that he pulled out. Not Impala, he says Malibu. Okay. Remember, he's a car guy. They, they kept saying he's a car guy. He says he pulled out a Malibu. He also says that uh, there was a white ox cord, right? But he also said that car had a, had a, a tan interior. That's a tan interior. I'm not sure it's a tan interior. The state, which buttresses my argument that they found only the evidence they want, do self-tower analysis on Mr. Brink's phone. Now we know where Mr. Brink lives. We know where Mr. Brink goes to work. Of course Mr. Brink's phone would hit off a tower on July 10th because that's, that's the route he takes to work every day. Had we done Mr. Brink's cell phone tower analysis for nine months, you're going to see that for nine months. But again, let's just do it for July 10th because that puts him as the man who pulled out this man from the ditch and it fits the timeline just perfectly, just perfectly for us. Okay, we start at that conclusion, let's get cell phone records for one day and bam, that fits our narrative. But the other, if we were collecting evidence about the case and being fair, we would have thought, let's get some from the spring and the fall as well, because Jared Brink said very clearly that it was cold that day. He thought it was the fall, he thought it was 40 or 50 degrees. So uh, let's not be fair about it. Let's just get the evidence we need so we can pin it on this guy. That speaks in volumes to the investigation that was done here. The other thing about the gun I think you need to think long and hard about is there was discussion about the gun and how guns in crimes like these many times are stolen. The, uh, they're illegal. Um, serial numbers get ground off. This gun was traced back to the point of origin and has never once been reported stolen. That gun was legally purchased and legally owned by somebody. Legally purchased and legally owned by somebody. And there's no connection to that gun to Henry Dinkins. So Henry Dinkins, if he did shoot that person, did not steal a gun from anybody. And he sure as, sure as heck didn't buy it from anybody. There'd be a, there'd be a reg, uh, record of it. All we know is that gun came from Iowa City. But that particular firearm was never, ever reported stolen. There'd be a record of that. People have guns stolen. People report them stolen. I want to point the court out next to this soil sample testing that the state really relies on. And I want the court to look very closely at the exhibit on that. There's a couple of things about that that I think are important and very explanatory. Um, again, that is another piece of evidence that fits the theory. So let's point to those three areas uh, of samples that were taken that are for inclusion, okay? Don't get tripped up by that word inclusion. It doesn't mean it's that, that it came from that area. It just means that uh, it cannot be eliminated, okay? It's those word tricks at the FBI place. Um, remember the testimony of uh, the individual who did the soil samples. First of all, the 10 samples came from a very small area, the size of an automobile, okay? Seven of those were absolutely not a match. Those are excluded. So the size of an automobile, seven don't match, three are supported for inclusion. That really doesn't tell us anything at all. This is it could be uh, the same soil. Uh, three out of ten, I would submit, you could probably find anywhere in the area. But look closely at that. We spent time talking about 
footprints that have nothing to do with anything. We spent time talking about Credit Island, nothing to do with anything. Um, we spent time with DL, and DL is a, a troubled young man. But as it pertains to the state, you cannot pick and choose those parts of his story that are consistent and say, well, he's consistent on one and two, uh, therefore we have to say our, our uh, investigation followed that. He was also consistent on other things that are not helpful to them. Um, but he was wholly inconsistent on major facts. Uh, he come into court, he's 11 years old, and the state tries to say he's traumatized and this and that, yet they offer no scientific, no expert evidence to say that his testimony could be colored by that. They could have had a psychologist here. They could have had someone to testify that he has these memories recurring through post-traumatic stress or whatever he would have had. They chose not to. Not his fault. But he came in here and testified under oath that he saw his father shoot Briasia. We know that's not true. We, he saw Andrea Culberson go along and see his father shoot Briasia. We know that's not true. But all of a sudden we hear the story about pouring bleach in the ditch for the very first time three years later after the number of times he's been interrogated and interviewed. Uh, that's very suspect. He's very antagonistic toward his father. He's being talked to by therapists and his mother. Uh, he's going to say whatever he needs to say to try to convict this guy. But we know the, the story about uh, sh being there for the shooting is not credible because you heard Officer Piper say the circumstances in which he believes uh, DL overheard it. It was when Officer Piper was telling Aisha the day they found out. So that testimony obviously was tainted. I also would submit, you heard the, the video from July 23rd yesterday, and DL was certain that when he talked about a bloody knife and said, I heard it down here. You guys down here told me about it. And the officer, Detective Hammes, was quick to just dismiss it. No, you didn't. And then she said, well, maybe he overheard people talking and stuff like that. I think that taints that testimony as well um, and they drive him around for three hours he takes him to Credit Island and said that's my dad's footprint and they assume it's his footprint and they start taking footwear impressions um, his, his testimony was just so all over the place um, that it was not credible he talks about a bloody machete where there's no blood on it he talks about cleaner bleach the first time we heard the term cleaner bleach was in here uh, before he was using bleach. But now we hear the term cleaner bleach. The photographs you're going to see in the RV, what do they say? They say cleaner bleach. He was coaching to saying that. And he's preparing for trial. He saw a picture that said cleaner bleach. That makes his story more credible. He's going to nail his dad. I feel sad for that kid. I feel very sad for that child. But his testimony has been tainted. Um, he said also that Briasia was alive twice at 5.30 a.m. That was on July 23rd. State says, you know, he's consistent on that and that drove their, that drove their investigation. That fact they ignored. They ignored the fact that he said Briasia was alive at 5.30 a.m. It was light out. Detective Hammes looked at her watch and said 538. They don't get to pick and choose what, what parts of his story they think are true and what part, part of the stories they think are untrue. They drove him to Clinton. They drove him to Clinton. And they pull into Walmart and, oh, this is where we were. They drove him to Credit Island. This is where we were. I mean, so much of this is is is... Uh, almost confirmation bias, Your Honor. Uh, you got an eight-year-old kid 
barely competent to even testify at that point in time, uh, being guided by police, and uh, again, being led down the uh, way, based upon a hunch, I think Detective Hammes said yesterday, based upon a hunch, we took him to Credit Island down that way. Um, and then, you know, he told them what he wanted to hear, what they wanted to hear. But Credit Island, it turns out, has nothing to do with anything. There were no six guys fishing. There was no fishing pool. But did that steer the investigation? Nope, it didn't. They ignore that. They ignore all that. But they find a couple of uh, places where they can say we can hang our hat on DL's testimony and we're going to hang our hat on that. The other stuff we're going to ignore because it doesn't fit the theory. It doesn't fit where we started and where we want to end up. He said on 61 and 30 we need to keep going straight and they ignored that. Why they ignore that? It didn't fit the narrative at that time. They come back, he's pointing at wooded areas saying, there, 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 there. They ignore that. That is looking at a case through tunnel vision. We're going to have DL hopefully tell us what we want to hear. We have evidence. We want, we want him to tell us stuff that matches up to that evidence. That's exactly what they were doing. Mr. Dinkins is so savvy that he was able to cover up all his crimes. So savvy. So good. He is a, uh, a psychopath with tendencies like no other to get away with his crime. You have to believe that. And that is unbelievable. Okay, so... He, Henry has to know, Your Honor, that when you commit a crime like sex assault, assuming that he committed sex assault, which we have no evidence of, that you leave behind DNA and trace evidence. First of all, D, uh, bleach does not destroy trace evidence. It destroys DNA. But it does not destroy hair, fibers, anything of that nature doesn't destroy any of that, which they found none of in that RV. They found no hair or fiber that connects Briege Terrell to that RV. Zero. So bleach argument on that, out the window. If he's sexually assaulting her, uh, there would be a hair that come off her. There would be uh, fibers from her clothes. And this, four, this 4X white t-shirt uh, comment that is somehow insidious on his part, uh, parents all over this country let their kids wear parents' t-shirts to bed. doesn't mean that they're trying to cover up a, a crime. That's somehow premeditation. That's just ridiculous. Uh, he let her wear the shorts and the bra, though. If he was trying to cover up a crime, why would he let her wear the shorts and the bra that... Uh, Aisha brought but covered up with a 4X t-shirt. That defies any logic <coughs> anywhere. But in any event, uh, he's such a, a so good at, at covering up his crimes that he is takes his, this bleach and he sprays it everywhere. Hits every item of DNA. Kills it all. Kills it all. And then not only does he kill it all, He's savvy enough that no one can smell bleach except the woman who opened the trunk and was pregnant and had the heightened senses. That's the only person that said they smelled bleach. Um, but it makes it so no one could smell it. it. Makes it that no one felt the or had the odor overcome them. So in a very short period of time. So he bleaches everything, somehow gets rid of the odor, gets rid of all the DNA. And gets away with it. He's that savvy. That's not savvy. That's next level generation crime stuff for which I, this court and this attorney has, 
I would say, never heard of. But when you don't find bleach, like on the, the remains, uh, it wasn't the state's fault because it was exposed to the elements. It was exposed to the elements, and there was an element of chlorine in the clothing. Your Honor, you know, chlorine is found everywhere. You heard uh, Mr. Stepanski. That's why he would, would not say that he, there was anything there consistent with bleach. He was very careful about that. Okay, he was pressed on that issue because the state wanted him to go that extra step and say, well, could it have been bleach? And he wouldn't say that. They want to argue that now, but Stepanski wouldn't say that. That's the evidence in the record. And chlorine in Iowa, salt in the soil, uh, farm chemicals in the soil, uh, just basic soil. I mean, there's going to be chlorine everywhere, but bleach? It has to be bleach? No. I think that's a, a, a fool's argument meant to try to prejudice you. And look at that picture of those black shorts. Okay, that's sun damage. And what do you do if you pour bleach on them? Just common sense. You've got a gallon of bleach, you're, you're pouring it over from six feet above, you're just dumping it, you're dumping it. You're going to get rid of all this. It's going to bleach almost immediately. It's going to splatter. You can have splatter marks. You don't see any of that. And in fact, Stepanski looked at that set of shorts and says, you know what? It's not even worth testing for bleach because he didn't test it. Okay, but they, they, but they had all this other stuff. That's what defies logic is they had all this other stuff. They had this stuff from the RV. They had the stuff from the Impala. They had all these cuttings. They had all this fabric. They had the car itself. They could have cut the, the um, fabric out of the trunk. They could have cut the back seat, the front seat. Send it all off to Mr. Stepanski and say, find us bleach, please. But no. No. We aren't going to do that. We aren't going to do that. Instead, they kind of want to shift the burden over to Mr. Dinkins and say, well, he didn't explain to us what he did. He didn't tell us what he was doing. He didn't explain to us about the gold shoes versus the white shoes. He didn't explain to us about things like pointing and writing on a Google map. You know, he, didn't, he didn't explain to us. He doesn't have to prove anything. They do. You can't forget. They had no DNA. And it wasn't for lack of looking on this man. Okay? They stripped him down naked. They swabbed his penis. They swabbed his hands. They went under his fingernails. And they found no DNA of Briasia Terrell. Oh, well, he must have, must have bathed or showered then. Not his responsibility. Theirs. And they didn't find any evidence that he did that. Well, he was driving around, he couldn't be found, his phone was off. That's why there's no DNA. Not his burden, their burden. Don't let them trick you into that. They had, they had DNA that could have been tested, possibly, out of the back of the Impala to put her in that car. They chose not to do that. Why not? They had no semen anywhere, no blood stains anywhere, no trace evidence anywhere. They just want you to believe that Henry Dinkins was acting irrationally, acting weird, and he bought some bleach. And since he wasn't the real father of Riesia Terrell, and real fathers have designs on their stepdaughters, if you will, or children that are on their own, they must have raped and molested her because she wound up dead. Because that's what happens. Stepfathers rape and murder their stepdaughters. The evidence is not here, Your Honor. Are you firmly convinced? Are you fully satisfied? Would you, are you, when you sit and think about this and go through all this evidence, um, will you hesitate to act? Reasonable doubt is all over this case. Serious doubt is all over this case. And 
there's only one one verdict here. You have to find Mr. Dinkins not guilty. Thank you. One more. Ms. Cunningham or Ms. O'Donnell? Ms. O'Donnell will be giving you a follow run. Thank you. Ms. O'Donnell, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Do you have a preference where I stand or don't stand? Or Wherever you would like to. Um, I know that it might be easier for everyone to hear if you're closer to a microphone. We do have the microphone positioned over here if you'd rather stand. You ready? I am. Okay. Speaking of ignoring evidence, what the defense is ignoring here is that Mr. Dinkins is the last person seen with Briasia Terrell when she is alive. And who made that observation? Who placed him with her is Andrea Culberson, the defendant's own girlfriend. She is the person who said, I looked out that window at 3.30 in the morning and I saw Briasia right next to that Chevy Impala. I saw her there, she was alive. And then the defendant leaves, car is gone, Briasia is gone. There was no one else in that parking lot. That is the last known sighting of Briasia. Andrea Culberson testified that when she saw Briasia, she actually felt relieved at that point in time because she at least knew, oh, she's with Henry. We know where she is. She's with Henry. However, after they left and as she testified, she couldn't even put into words what she was feeling because she was confused. She didn't know what was going on. She didn't know why he had taken Briasia out of their apartment at 3 o'clock in the morning and then again at 3.30 in the morning. And because of the nature of their relationship and who they were, she didn't ask. But she didn't call the police. She didn't go searching for Briasia because she knew that Briasia wasn't missing at that point. She knew where she was. She knew who she was with. And so when the police showed up at their apartment shortly before 9 a.m. in the morning, suddenly looking for Briasia, wondering where she is, wanting to search the apartment, looking for her, you can see on that video how much Andrea is hesitating. She doesn't want them to come in and search for Briasia. She wants to make sure that Henry knows gave permission to come into the apartment because she is confused because she knows that Briasia left with Henry and that he's the last person to have had her. So why are the police here looking for her, searching for her? Why is Henry saying it's okay for them to come in and search her apartment knowing full well that he's the one who had her last? been trying to figure out why the defense has not been trying to attack Andrea Culberson's credibility at all throughout the course of this trial. There was no impeaching her. There was no trying to question her on her timeline and on her events or any of those facts. That's because they can't. They can't do that. But who did they chose to go after? And that was DL. There was extensive questioning about his credibility and about what he saw or what he didn't see in his statements and his various statements. Why? When so much of what he said has been corroborated, not only by Andrea, but by video surveillance, um, by other types of evidence. Why are we attacking this child and not Andrea Culberson? And that's because if you look at the information that DL was providing, not only does he describe things that are corroborated, like I said, by other evidence, 
But he also places the defendant out at Kunal Implement on the morning of July 10th. He, based on his statements, corroborates that the defendant didn't search, made no efforts that morning to go look for Briasia, like he reported that he had been doing. DL, the morning of July 10th, when he's interviewed by police and as the court got to observe, is a carefree kid. He's unconcerned. His sister's lost, but you know, it's, it's kind of just not a big deal at that point in time. He is not appreciating at all the severity of that situation. He doesn't understand what is going on. And so when he is interviewed and he starts talking about going fishing with his dad that morning and they, the places that they went, or that his dad pulled out bleach and was wiping off this big knife, he doesn't understand the significance of the things that he's saying or why those things may be relevant or not relevant. He talks about his dad being stuck on a dirt road and that there were these guys, these six fishermen, who had to push his dad out. His dad had gone fishing. His dad paid them a hundred bucks. Now again, if you from those statements, those are not things that DL actually saw. Those are things that his father had told him occurred. And now this is, again, on July 10th, well before we knew anything about a dirt road, well before we knew anything about this Impala being stuck, months before Jared Brink came forward to talk about pulling a Chevy Impala out of the ditch on 270th Avenue, mere feet from where Briege's remains were found. DL has no idea what significance any of these things offer. But included in those statements, and when he does drive them around, he starts to describe more. Again, on July 10th, he recognizes Schmidt Road. He talks about this RV. He describes this fishing place as having a little hill. And he kept saying, you had to go down there. He walked down there. He took bleach down there by the water. They do drive him to Credit Island, where he recognizes it. He has them park in the gravel. He shows them the path of travel that he watched his father take. He stayed in the car. And sure enough, there are footprints there. Um, again, he talks about this machete of being cleaned off with bleach. They go to that RV. There's a machete there. And again, talking about those driving around in that Impala. And then you heard the testimony from Jim Peters who has those cadaver dogs. Where did his dogs hit? Credit Island, the RV, that Impala, all places that the defendant went after we submit that he had killed Briasia Terrell. All places that DL said that he went the morning where he's supposedly out searching for Briasia. Those are not just coincidences. Again, the, the testimony from Jim Peters about what the cadaver dogs actually do is they hit on the smell of those uh, molecules that attach, that scent that attaches to objects like shoes that a person could have been wearing at the time that they committed a crime. Shoes that were in that Impala. Shoes that he wore walking around Credit Island. Shoes that he wore when he was standing around his RV and then went into his RV. Shoes that he later disposed of and that the officers were never able to recover. So again, that odor of bleach, DL said that he smelled it. Even on July 10th, he could smell bleach, something that Again, Detective Tharp testified to that when she first opened that trunk, she could smell bleach. Um, which is consistent with somebody opening a bottle of bleach, cleaning it, using it, and then throwing that bottle of bleach back into a trunk. 
not necessarily submitting that the defendant took bleach and wiped down everything inside of that trunk, but just that there was an open container of bleach at some point in time in that trunk, which would emit an odor of bleach that wouldn't necessarily last for days and days and days. Now, again, when we're talking about DL and the areas and things that he described, that area near Kunal Implement, now he testified that after they had gone to Walmart and purchased bleach um, on the morning of July 10th, they went to this dirt road where he observed his father walking with those um, bottles of bleach and dumping out bleach all over some bushes. Again, when you're looking at why are we attacking DL's credibility, what is the point of making him look like the person who's just making things up? It's again, it's because he's placing the defendant there where Briage's remains were found. Now, this whole statement about whether DL actually saw the defendant shooting Briasia, that wasn't something that he even testified to on direct. That was purposely brought up by the defense on cross-examination, again, to attempt to impeach DL. That wasn't something he actually testified to. And again, what was the purpose of bringing that up? if not to try to discredit absolutely everything that he provided. And while we don't know what DL did see, didn't see, what actually happened, what he may have heard while he was out at certain locations, uh, it is worth noting that without missing a beat when asked what color the gun was, he said silver. And when officers found that gun, they described it as a stainless steel gun. That's how they labeled it on the um, evidence records. And if DL was just going to try to make something up and just try to come up with some story, it is odd that he'd pick silver as the color and not black when most guns in this world are black. And even a child knows that. Again, when we're talking about what the state ignored, in terms of the evidence here. What the defense is also ignoring is that Henry's DNA was not found in the Impala. His DNA was not found on the, in the RV. When we say that Mr. Dinkins is savvy, if you look at those actions and the things that he did on this particular evening, leaving his cell phone at home to charge when he has cell phone chargers in his vehicle, wiping down a machete with bleach, a machete that we submit was used to cut branches. That's it. Those are steps taken that show the level of thoroughness that he had when it came to covering his tracks that day taking the battery out of his phone after being forced to take his phone with him. Again, those are steps that he took to try to cover his tracks, to try to make him untraceable. Obviously, bleach, we've heard the testimony, it does kill DNA. Um, but obviously, this is a case as well where Briage's body was not found for months, several months almost nine months, I believe, between when she went missing and when she was recovered. You heard the testimony from Mike Schmidt about what the environment can do to DNA. And it is worth noting that even in the clothing that Bereja presumably died in, they didn't even find her DNA on those clothes, clothes that she probably bled in, that she had some level of decomposition in, and yet her DNA is not even found on those clothes. To, so to suggest that because there's just no DNA at all, that that's what the court needs to hang its head on is simply not reasonable.
When the court heard testimony from FBI Special Agent James McMillan, one of the things he described was when you have any missing person case, your goal is to start with that person, the person who's missing, to try to establish their last known whereabouts. And then you start with the people who were the most intimate or close to them, the people who saw them last. And you try to establish a timeline for their last known whereabouts in an attempt to either exclude them as somebody who could potentially abduct them or include them. And that is exactly what this investigation did from the get-go. They were provided information that the last known person seen with Mr. Dinkins, or I'm sorry, with Briasia was Mr. Dinkins. And from that information, the Davenport Police Department, the FBI, the DCI Crime Lab, all set out to try to establish the last known whereabouts of Mr. Dinkins, to try to exclude him or include him as a potential person who could have abducted Briasia. And they were never able to exclude him, ever. When you look at his behavior, the evening that she went missing, according to his own statements, at some point, he searched for her, he found out she was missing, he never woke up Andrea Culberson, he never woke up Detorius, he never made a single phone call. In fact, he wasn't even thinking about his phone in a time like this, when you have a missing child, which is just a crazy statement to make. Instead, he got in his car and he just left. He couldn't point to a single location that he drove to. He couldn't point to a single door that he knocked on. He made absolutely no effort to actually search for Briasia because he knew she was never missing. He knew exactly where she was. He didn't need to go look for her. He didn't need to wake up anybody else and alert them to the fact that Briasia was missing. In fact, he was trying to avoid having to alert anybody to the fact that Briasia was missing. He didn't count on the fact that Andrea Culberson woke up and knew he was gone. And in fact, according to Andrea's testimony, when he came back to the apartment at 3.30 in the morning, she heard him kind of quietly open the door and quietly try to step upstairs because he was trying to avoid causing any sort of attention or bringing attention to himself. He was trying to be quiet and discreet. <clears throat> now, the defense wants to argue that there's no evidence of a sexual assault. And I would just note for the court um, that the state's not required to prove that the defendant actually sexually assaulted Beresha Terrell. What we are required to prove is that when he removed her from this location, from this apartment, his intent was to either sexually assault her or to cause her serious bodily injury. And I submit to this court that there is really no reason why an adult male would take a child at three o'clock in the morning from this place where she's sleeping to another secluded area where she had never been um, without some sort of ill intent. Whether that is sexually abusing her, whether that's causing her harm, there is no reason to do that at three o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. Um, without some sort of nefarious plan for that child. And there was a decision made, a decision made to harm her, to kill her. Briasia knew Henry. She could identify him. This is not some strange child. This is somebody that she knew intimately and that he knew if she were to tell what he did to her, that she would be believed because Briasia is a truth teller. And so a decision was made that he had to kill her.
Now, we know that he came back to that apartment after he had taken Briasia down to that trailer. And I submit to the court, why would he need to come back to the apartment? What was the purpose of doing that? Why take that risk that she may be seen if it wasn't to get something that had to be so important to him, something so necessary for him to achieve his goal of killing Briasia? He came back for a gun. He went to that closet. We know that he has access to weapons. There was a knife under the mattress, a machete under the mattress in that apartment, in his own vehicle. He had an ax, he had a bat, he had an empty knife sheath, and then in the, the RV he had another machete. We know he has access to weapons. It is not unfathomable to think that he also has access to other firearms. Now, Andrea Culberson stated that she did not ever look in his closet. She didn't know what was in there, but when he came to that apartment, he snuck up the stairs, he went to the closet, he dug something out, concealed it on his person, and then he left. Why? Why did he need to come back there if not to grab a weapon? He then took Briasia and he left. Now we know he had to fill up his tank with gas, that's where he went. He's on the video there where he's acting odd, he keeps looking out to that car. And there was a lot of discussion during the defense closet clothing about why Briasia, this rule follower, this tattletale, why she wouldn't have tried to run, why she wouldn't have told somebody about what was happening at 3.30 in the morning when she was outside of that car. And again, it shouldn't be lost on this court that we are talking about a 10-year-old child. A 10-year-old who did trust Mr. Dinkins. This was her brother's father. This was somebody who, according to DL himself, she had been having fun over at this apartment. She enjoyed the snacks. They were playing games. She was having a great time. And then this person took her from her bed took her to some trailer where we submit he then sexually assaulted her and hurt her and then now is taking her around again to this apartment where she had never been, didn't know anybody else there, an area of Davenport she had never really spent any time in. And we're expected to believe that she should have just ran away if she was really that scared of him. Because apparently that's what we're going to do now is blame Briasia for not getting herself out of that situation. And how frightened she must have been in that moment when she's outside of that car. This man had already hurt her. And we don't know what types of conversations or what he may have said to her in those moments. And I submit he threatened to kill her brother. You move, you say anything, I'll kill Dio. And this child, this rule follower, follower, this protector of her brother would have stayed. She would not have ran off or done anything in those moments if she thought that that would somehow impact somebody else. And again, when she's driving to quick stop or when he drives to quick stop it's the middle of the night she doesn't know where she is we expect her just to get out and run okay, we're talking about what that fear that she must have been feeling and that experiencing in those moments The defense wants to argue that because 
Mr. Dinkins didn't act the way we would expect him to act when his child is missing, that that's what the state's hanging their head on. That that's what we're saying here is he's guilty because he acted funny when she went missing. And what is worth noting here is that there are behaviors and there are certain actions that do go towards somebody's consciousness of guilt. And if you look at Mr. Dinkins' actions and the way he was reacting to what was happening in this situation, his behavior is so completely goes against any way that a parent would act if their child is missing. If you wake up at 3 in the morning or whatever time that he's, because again, he wouldn't give a time, uh, and noted that Briasia was missing, you wake people up. You call the police. You start banging on doors. You call her mother. You start looking for her. You panic. You panic. And instead, he's driving to Clinton, Iowa to buy bleach. He goes down to Credit Island with the DL. He goes to his trailer with DL. We know at some point that he changed his clothes because he is seen um, on the quick shop video wearing one outfit. You heard testimony from Andrea Culberson that when he came back to the apartment to get DL, he had changed his clothes. And she noted that that was very odd because he hadn't changed them there. So that meant he would have had to have changed his clothes somewhere else. And then again, after you see him at Walmart wearing um, the same outfit he's seen when he meets with Officer Burkle um, outside of that apartment, he changes his shoes. Those are not actions. Those are not steps people take when your child is missing. You don't care what you're wearing. You don't care what your shoes look like. You are panicked. You are upset. You are freaking out. You don't have the wherewithal to go, you know what, I think I'm going to wear different shoes now. I should go change them. And it shouldn't be lost on the court, the, the shorts that he was wearing that you see in the quick shot video, the shoes that he had on, none of those items were ever found. The two bottles of bleach that were purchased from Clinton, never found. what we do know is that after the defendant left the apartment the morning of July 10th, after making contact with uh, Officer Burkle, his phone records show that he was in the area of his sister's house. And we know again from phone records that his sister and his mom were home at that time. And it's awfully convenient that after there's a brief period of time where his sister and his mom are home. They leave. They leave and go up to Tama to go gambling, which is also a very odd reaction for finding out that Mr. Dinkins' daughter, according to him, is missing. But none of those items that he had were ever found again. Now, the defense wants the court to completely discount anything offered by Jared Brink. And again, that's because Jared Brink places the defendant on July 10th outside on that road of 270th Avenue, right where Briasia's remains were found. And again, if you're looking at all of the information that Jared Brink provided, if he is describing somebody else that is not Mr. Dinkins, then Mr. Dinkins must be the most unlucky man alive. Because what you heard from Jared Brink was that on this night, around 4.30 in the morning, a black man flags him down on Highway 61 because his car got stuck on this road on 270th Avenue. The man gets in his car, they drive back to this area where whoever this other person is, is also driving a maroon Chevy Impala. 
and they also happen to have light colored tan interior seats and also happen to have a white aux cord that's plugged right in there and the right tire of this vehicle is the tire that just so happens to be stuck on this ditch again that right tire where seized that vehicle was seized on july 10th you can see that there's visible dirt on the car and that area of the car is where those soil samples were matched for that particular area of that particular road. Uh, again, this man offers him $100, um, which again is the same night that we know the defendant paid $100 for gas. Um, the same time period where the defendant reported paying $100 to some fishermen and told that story to DL. Um, this man didn't have a cell phone, or he had no means of calling somebody for help. That's why he had to flag down somebody on the road. And again, wearing those shorts, the same shorts that he identified, um, the defendant wearing, the night that Briasia Terrell went missing, the night that he was the last known person to see her, on the night, the one night that she has ever stayed over at his house. If we're talking about somebody else here, again, that's just not reasonable. It's not reasonable to think that all of those different factors and all of those descriptors, that we're talking about a different individual that isn't Mr. Dinkins. Defense counsel brought up the state's burden of proof in this case. As the court notes, it is not, the standard is not being totally convinced. It is firmly convinced. Uh, they also note the language, this hesitate to act, um, which is in the instruction that the Supreme Court does not prefer that we use. However, if we're going to be talking about this hesitating to act, the stopping to think, I would submit to the court that stopping to think and considering all the evidence is, is actually the job of the fact finder. That doesn't mean you're hesitating. That doesn't mean that there's some sort of pause on your part to have to look at all of the evidence here and looking at the totality of it to decide whether that you are about fully and fairly convinced. That's in fact the court's job as a fact finder is to deliberate. Um, and decide the evidence from the evidence there. One statement from the defendant that we heard testimony from when those inmates at the Clinton County Jail who testified that they heard the defendant after after seeing a news story about this story about Briage's disappearance he turned to them and he said they are never going to find her and those people thought that was very odd they thought that was weird you heard the testimony from I believe it was uh, David Baker about how he immediately took that to mean, this guy knows way more about what's going on. He knows more than what he's talked about. And the court has seen what this area, Kunal Implement, looks like in July. It's heard testimony about the trees and the different brush in that area and how difficult it is to actually see anything during that time period. You could be standing mere feet from where her body was found and you cannot see her because they're never going to find her. That is what he reported to those individuals. Um, one thing that uh, defense and the state can agree on was that this was a horrific act committed by a horrific person. This was an execution. When he drove Briasia to this place, 
place she had never been, this wooded area with barely any lighting. The fear that she must have felt, not knowing where she was going, not knowing where she was take, going to be taken and what was going to happen to her. Then as he got her out of the car, pointed that gun at her, and she knew that she was going to die without ever seeing her brother, without ever seeing her mom ever again. Again, that statement, they are never going to find her. Your Honor, when you look at all of this evidence here, and you look at the state's burden of proof, this is not a situation where the state just focused in on one person and one person only, and you look at all those facts, The defendant's actions that night and what he did to this little girl, to Briasia, he needs to be held accountable for that. And the evidence clearly shows that he is guilty of both of these offenses beyond a reasonable doubt. And we would ask that you return a verdict of guilty for both counts. Thank you. Thank you. I will take this matter under advisement and have a ruling as quickly as I can. Thank you. Thank you.